Today, I am very pleased to uh, introduce uh, uh, Simon Abernethy, who's a transport historian, a London historian, who has, uh, you know, published, uh, well, he did his PhD, he completed that in 2015, uh, and that was, I've got the title here, Class, Gender and Commuting in London, 1880 to 1940. And he's published since on workmen's trains and moving the public during World War One, And he's also uh, published on the new so survey of London life and labor between 1928 and 1932. So um, he's gonna talk to us today about what transport in London can tell us about uh, um, the society in which it was operating. So Simon, uh, welcome, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much, David. Uh, all right, I'm just going to share my screen, um, and hopefully we can all see my opening slide. Um, so thank you all so much for, for attending. Um, this is my first uh, seminar presenting digitally, so please forgive me for looking a bit like an air traffic controller who's lost on his way to work, um, or a bit like a 1960s Cyberman, actually, the more I look at myself. So the title of this um, presentation is it's called Full Snobs and Men, and it's a title that I lovingly stole from a article that I read from a paper that was published in 1883. And I really like the phrase because it really sums up in four words what I'm really going to be talking about. So the idea of class distinctions, your fools, your first class passengers, your snobs, your second class passengers, and your men, your third class passengers, and strikingly the fact that it doesn't mention women at all, which is a recurring thing when looking at, at 19th century railways, particularly in the context of commuting. Um, so what we're going to do is do a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour. So we're going to start um, around about the 1830s. We're going to end up around about the 1930s. We're going to have a quick look at workmen's trains because we're largely going to be looking at London, and that's going to be quite a, a, an important detour that we take. Then we're going to look at, at class, and then we're going to look at gender. Um, and particularly how they're treated slightly differently. So what I'll do is carry on. So, oh, and then I've gone too fast, typical. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about are workman's trains. So workman's trains are um, trains that are operated all over the United Kingdom for nominally for workmen and at a very cheap rate. So London in particular hosts a large number of workmen's trains. Um, the first workmen's train service starts operating in 1864. And one of the reasons that we get to talk about class so much um, in London in particular is because of these trains. So a big part of the historiography for railway transport and commuting in the late 19th century is that it's only really open to the middle class. Um, London's in rapid expansion. We know that between uh, 1860 and 1901, London's outer suburban areas expand from around about 400,000 people to over 2 million people. So it doubles and doubles again in the space of 40 years. Um, a lot of that suburbanization is middle class, um, but not all of it. So workmen's trains become increasingly popular from their introduction in 1864. Um, and what we have is the creation of a system of extremely cheap fares that can carry workmen um, of all sorts very, very long distances. Um, we go from a state of play in 1882, where we have 7.2 million tickets issued. By 1902, we're nearly at 100 million tickets issued. Um, and the kinds of people these tickets were used by were really wide range of the working classes. Um, often the idea is that the only working class commuter was someone who had regular earnings. So a top end artisan like a mechanic or a master builder. Actually, when you look at the kinds of people who are using workmen's trains, like this fella here, who I've cited down in the bottom right, George, um, we have general laborers using the trains. We have working class women using the trains. Um, we even have children. Um, so children that have left at the age of 14, which was the school leaving age, um, who basically pay into a family pot. And in doing so, they can afford to use workmen's trains and they travel into the center of London. The key thing to note though, is that it's very selective. So what we have here is a map of the workman's train system, for want of a better word, in 1883. Um, the dots are railway stations all across London, and you can see the fares that they're charging for traveling to the relevant London terminal. So the red dots are two penny trains. 
So these are trains that will get you in and out of London for the cost of two pence a day. Um, extremely cheap, described in some quarters as some of the cheapest trains in the world. And what you'll see is there's this wonderful red snake snaking its way up to North London. And that's the Great Eastern Railway up to Enfield from Liverpool Street. You'll also see three red dots in the east. That's Walthamstow, again on the Great Eastern Railway. And the Great Eastern Railway is a bit of a special case. In 1864, it had its act authorising the construction of Liverpool Street Station. As part of that act, they were compelled to run a two penny workman's train daily from Edmonton and Walthamstow to the centre and back again, Monday through Saturday. Now, the original idea of putting that into the act was that people who've been displaced by the construction of Liverpool Street Station, and it displaces thousands of working class people because their homes are demolished, um, would then move up the railway line and commute in. Now, obviously, it's not the case that your house gets demolished on Tuesday, and then the following day, there's a brand new railway terminal that you can travel to and from with. So it, it doesn't really play out like that. The people whose homes are demolished almost certainly don't move into the suburbs. They just pack into the surrounding urban area, um, which contributes to the housing crisis. But what it does is it creates this underlying system that other people can make use of in the decades that follow. In 1883, we get the Cheap Trains Act. Now, the Cheap Trains Act adds a little bit of a complication to the picture. So the initial workman's trains are these specific trains set by act. The Cheap Trains Act basically says that if railway companies offer sufficient trains for workmen, and the term sufficient isn't defined and the term workman isn't defined, they will get a remission of passenger duty on fares of a penny per mile or under. So effectively, they get a big tax rebate if they run these trains. Now, what it also doesn't set are the fares for those workmen's trains. And what happens is the railway companies see what happens on the Great Eastern, so that red line up into the north. And what happens on the Great Eastern is effectively what's perceived as degentrification. The amount of working class suburbanization in those areas is considered excessive compared to what you see in the rest of London. And the railway executives of the Great Eastern Railway do not enjoy this experience at all. The other railway executives see this happening. And they go, well, we'll offer workman's trains because we want the tax rebate, but we'll set the fares as high as we can pretty much push them. So the workman's train system expands, but it never expands to the degree that we have two penny trains running out all across London. You can see actually even in the West and Southwest, we have trains which are charging over 10 pence for a return journey. Um, and in this period, it's assumed that the maximum a working class commuter can regularly afford is four pence. So it really limits where people can move. And at a time of really rapid suburban expansion and a housing crisis that's pushing people out of the center, what happens is this, which, it go, which is basically, it goes all skiwiff. So the blue lines that you can see there are workman's trains or workman's passenger flows. The red lines are the ordinary traffic. So this is traffic of third class, second class and first class. And what you can see is that you have workmen concentrated in certain areas. So you again, you have Edmonton, Enfield, Walthamstow. You also have a, a big traffic that's grown up towards East Ham and West Ham on the London Tilbury and South End Railway. That may be a bit slightly different as in those are areas that develop up around the docks. There's probably a large core of working class people there already. Um, but this is what starts creating a, a lot of that mix. So in London, you can potentially have a load of working class passengers come through your station and then middle class passengers, upper middle class passengers, the works. Um, so it creates quite an unusual scenario in London, which isn't perhaps reflective in the UK generally, um, but it's what makes London particularly interesting. And it's worth bearing this in mind as we go through the rest. The other thing that we need to bear in mind is time and the importance of time in all this. So what we have in the late 19th century and certainly before the war is a commuting system that's divided by time and class. And time and class are broadly interchangeable. And that's class in terms of social class and in terms of the class of accommodation you're traveling in. So this graph is based on a, a series of surveys the London County Council did um, over a couple of years at the turn of the century. And they surveyed around 45,000 passengers and they had inspectors go out all across stations and basically count passengers as they came on. Now they used four main groupings, workmen, which you can see in red, 
women, which you can see in purple as a dashed line. And they didn't distinguish between working class women or middle class clerical work, female clerical workers, um, which again kind of reinforces this idea that women commuters are really marginalized in this period. They're not really looked at in any detail. Um, the blue dashed line are clerical workers, male clerical workers, and the green line is boys. So people who are identifiably youths who are on their way to work. And what you can see is very early in the morning, it's all workman's traffic. And that's because working class men tend to get to work between four o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning. They might travel in a bit later during the winter, but certainly during the summer, they're on site basically when the sun goes up because that's what the gig is. Um, working class women are quite interesting. So their work actually starts a lot later, it starts around nine o'clock, but because the earnings they're getting are so low, they tend to travel earlier in the morning because it's all they can afford. So you can see that peak there, the little purple peak, I'll just wave the cursor around. Um, this is actually the last couple of workmen's trains from Edmonton. And what the Great Eastern Railway did there was they held back uh, a proportion of tickets for specifically for women. Uh, and these women would travel in, they tended to be employed in things like machining, box making, that kind of sort of employment. Um, and then they would loiter around London um, for a good few hours until their work began. And if you're ever in the locale of Liverpool Street, there's a church called, I believe it's All Hallows, which is just around the corner from Pizza Pilgrims. Um, but All Hallows actually used to open its doors from about half seven, six o'clock in the morning. Um, and a lot of women and children would actually go to All Hallows and wait there until their employment started. You can also see the, the dash blue line, that really starts picking up after sort of seven o'clock. That's your clerical traffic, they tend to start around eight o'clock. So we have this sort of system of fares, we have this system of time, and that kind of keeps people apart to varying degrees of success. Um, and it allows us to see these kind of wonderful cartoons, and one of the best things about uh, looking at public transport uh, sort of around this period are the wonderful cartoons that are produced. Um, so on left, we have this image from Punch in 1914, the 535 workman's train. We have Bill and Herb, and Herb's heading up to work. And you can see Herb has a, a shovel that he's carrying with him. Um, a big complaint, particularly from railway management at the time, was that workman passengers kept wandering around with various tools and implements. Uh, the general manager of the district railway um, Robert Perks complained that they started carrying great logs, which they were taking home with which to light their fires and things like this. Uh, and the idea was that they were actually quite unpleasant to travel alongside, um, which again is why they reinforced the system of, of fares in particular class. Um, on the right, we have this wonderful image from H.M. Bateman, the 845. So these are your company directors, your senior management, the kind of people that don't need to travel in particularly early. They travel in rather late. They're the kind of people that might take a Pullman car into their work. Um, typically, they'll be traveling first class. So you, you have this juxtaposition of social class and time. So bear that in mind because what we're now gonna do is talk more generally about class and particularly around how class is seen on the railways. What I find really interesting is that I remember reading um, something many moons ago and there was a historian who said the railway companies don't, don't really care about social class. All they care about is selling you a ticket. If you turn up and you're willing to pay X, they'll sell you a ticket for X. If you wanna pay Y, they'll sell you a ticket for Y. They're not that interested in, in who you are. And I think that's completely wrong. The railway companies in this period are hugely interested in who you are because what they want to do is replicate what they see is society at large, because that's what people are comfortable with. Railway traveling, and we'll largely be focusing on the railways for this, this aspect, is very new, it's very novel. It introduces a series of shared spaces that most people of the time wouldn't be used to. If you're someone who you know, would be considered upper class, you're not going to be spending a huge amount of time with a general labourer. The railways just about make that possible. Now, when the railways first come about, that kind of interlinking between someone's social class and the class of travel isn't necessarily there because they're so new. So in the 1830s, we know that the Marcus of Londonderry goes around on an outside seat and by all accounts has a jolly good time of it too. Um, in the 1830s, the London and Greenwich Railway began offering third class tickets, but the third class ticket meant you had to stand up. So it wasn't necessarily um, a sort of a, an idealization of class. It was just the fact that you're standing, so we won't charge you as much because we can really stuff you all in. 
But what starts happening is you get an association fairly rapidly that first class is for people who are upper class, second class are your sort of squeezed middle classes, and third class for your working class. Um, and there's this wonderful image on the, on the left there from the Epsom races, this is 1847. And at the top, you have your quite identifiably upper class people. There's a few of them. They've paid for the luxury and expensive space. You can see some curtains in the carriage. Um, there's sort of very respectable looking ladies traveling with them. Below that, we have uh, this squeezed middle, in this sense, quite literally squeezed as they're all trying to cram onto the, the carriages. But again, they've got their top hats. They're looking relatively respectable. And at the bottom, we have what effectively is the party bus. Um, third class, open, we've got flags. Everyone's clearly a bit drunk and having a great time. Now, it's worth saying that this is an excursion train, which is um, a little bit different from commuting traffic, but it's kind of this idealization um, that first class, upper class, second class, middle class, third class, working class. And these ideas get applied across London and they also get applied to sort of commuting traffic. So there was a wonderful letter written into the, the Times in 1874, which basically said that uh, work at third class passengers were rude, exigent, and generally more or less drunk. And you know, they, they, they're clearly not. Um, but it's all part of this idea that the working classes are dangerous and that idea is applied to third class. So we have an illustration here from the Illustrated London Police News, that well-known bastion of measured reporting, um, thoroughly accurate. Uh, and this is a, a, an image purportedly of the Trafalgar Square riots, which effectively in 1886, there was a demonstration around Trafalgar Square. It all got a little bit out of hand um, and a working class mob basically tore through the West End. And you can see there's a gentleman there being, being vehemently assaulted. And he, he doesn't look too different from the kinds of second class passengers we saw in the image from the Epsom races. Um, we also have this wonderful little quote from the British Medical Journal, um, which basically claimed that common amongst Londoners are physical strength and a love of fighting. Um, and it certainly hasn't changed since, but it all plays into this kind of fear of the working class mob. And the working class mob now has access to the railways. And for a lot of other people traveling on the railways, that's quite scary. We have this wonderful letter to the Times from 1884 um, by a, a gentleman uh, traveling first class who basically explained that his carriage was being beset by this mob of third class, ca uh, third class passengers. Um, they're not desirable. And what he does is he purchases himself a railway key and a railway key is effectively a staff key that you use for locking carriages. Um, it shouldn't be open to the general public, but he's managed to buy himself one. And what he does is he locks his compartment so people can't physically get in there with him. And he says, I'm justified by the fact I am driven to it in self-defense in order to secure the rights of privacy and comfort for which I have paid. Um, it's a wonderful justification, but it gives you this idea of how um, space and exclusivity are really important to people who ultimately have that at home. You know, someone who can afford a first class ticket is someone who is not of poor means by any means. Um, they would be ex uh, used to having that exclusivity and it's applied to the train service. It's applied to their space. It's not anyone else's space, it's their space. There's also a, a couple of other ideas that you get and again, it kind of lingers on this idea of space. So again, a, a, a short extract from a letter to the Times in 1888, um, where essentially a first class passenger says, I don't even care about the fittings. The cushions are very nice, but the main thing isn't what's in the compartment, it's what's not in the compartment, which is other people. That's fantastic. Um, We'll come on to it a little bit later, but in, in 1875, the Midland Railway ab abolished second class. And one of the big complaints about that isn't actually from second class passengers, it's from first class passengers who complain that they're gonna have hordes of the middle classes, these second class people coming into their carriages and ruining everything because they'll just, they'll just trash it. Um, so it's this kind of repeated idea around exclusivity. Um, and there's also a little jibe from Punch there around the notion that you know, I've paid for my ticket and I expect my entire compartment to myself. Moving on to second class passengers, there's a bit of a stereotype around them, which I think has some basis in fact. The idea is that these are people that have stretched means, um, but they go on the railway because it's seen as respectable. 
if I travel second class, people think I'm middle class. Um, again, a, a nice little uh, cartoon and quote from Moonshine, which was a, a London periodical of the time, essentially a bit like Punch. Um, and you can see effectively that we have a guy who it's, it's implied that he, he is not a man of means, um, but he travels second class because of the respectability of doing so, and also the fear of, of the third class. And what's interesting is the railway companies cotton onto that. So at the top, we have a, a, an extract from the Times in 1891. This is a, an, an opinion piece. And it's interesting because the 1890s are quite late in the day for, for this kind of thing. But there's still this ref, uh, sort of idea that third class is rowdy, it's drunk, and it's dangerous. And below is this interesting quote from Charles Scotter, who was the general manager of the London and South Western Railway. And this, I think, is a really good example of how the railways play class. So Scotter basically says, our third class ca carriages are just as good as our second class carriages. There's basically no difference. But we have millions of passenger journeys made on the London and South Western Railway for 50% more than the third class ticket just because the people want the respectability of going second. And it's about taking that wider societal idea of being middle class and then applying it to a railway system and doing that in a way that makes you a profit. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the Midland Railway. The abolition of second class on the Midland Railway in 1875 is, is a bit of an oddity because it's not quite what it seems. What the Midland do is they remove um, second class they bring the first class fare down, they put on a load of Pullman cars. And the idea is that they're actually trying to force the first class passengers onto their Pullman trains. Um, but what it does is spark a little bit of an identity crisis. And you can see again here, it's an image from Punch. Um, you have this, this respectable woman and she basically says, I can't afford to go first, I won't go third. And again, it's about maintaining that, that social position. And it's what a lot of the railways do really, really well. And the London and South Western Railway with Scotter does it possibly to the, the greatest extreme in terms of pulling out that snobbishness that makes people pay ever so slightly more to basically do the same journey. What's also happening at the time though is the number of second and first class passengers is declining. So in absolute terms, it's broadly increasing over the 19th century um, with the expansion of the railway system, but proportionally it's massively in decline. So in 1837, 20% of passengers travel first class, 40% second, 40% third. By 1891, we have 3% traveling first class, 5% second, and 92% third. And that's interesting because in 1891, we had that Times quote saying that third class is, is rough, boisterous, rowdy, and drunk. And if that's true, apparently 90%, nine out of 10 railway passengers are having a great time in third class. Um, and that's clearly not what's happening. And this is where we get into this idea of, of the changing notion of that space. So third class goes from being this kind of very drunken, boisterous area to being quite a respectable one. So this is a, a cartoon from H.M. Bateman. It's from 1916. It's entitled, It's the Same Man, which is a bit confusing because it's not actually a reference to the individuals in the carriage. Um, it's effectively a war propaganda cartoon. And the rest of the cartoon shows this clerical worker who's a bit simpering and a bit physically weak. Um, and at the end of the cartoon, he's transformed into wearing a tin hat, charging through barbed wire and kind of leading the charge in the First World War. Um, but what's so interesting about it is Bateman's highlighted on the inside of the carriage door, a giant three, so it's third class. No railway carriage has its class of, of track or of class of compartment inside the carriage. It's a bit pointless. So it's been put in there intentionally to show that this guy doesn't have a huge amount of means. He's, he can't afford to go second class. He can't afford to go first class. Um, but what's interesting is how respectable it is. These are all clearly middle class commuters. They're all clerical workers. They're all reading. They're smoking. But it's not a, a drunken, violent, angry space. And what we see over the 19th century is that the broader societal changes, particularly in London, push out the idea that first and second class are particularly respectable. And you get this idea that third class is, is the class for the everyman. Anyone can use it, it's safe. Part of that is maybe the creation of the railway police. A lot of the, the uh, railways have their own police forces. 
there's uh, an inquiry, um, a parliamentary inquiry in the 1890s, which says that drunkenness has decreased since the 1870s due to the temperance movement, which again, the jury may be slightly out. But the biggest thing is we're looking at a really different type of traffic. We're looking at working class commuters who broadly would be considered respectable. It's the rise of the respectable urban working classes. We're not looking at excursion traffic anymore. We're not looking at races um, like we did at Epsom in 1847. These are around people traveling to work. And at the end of the day, they want to get to work and they want to get home. And that creates this safer space. But what's also important to remember is we still have that chopping up by time. So workmen's trains probably cream off what we would consider the, the roughest or the most boisterous customers. Um, and what you also probably do is, is get this kind of um, situation where because of the division by time, it's, it's not as apparent as maybe it would otherwise be, uh, although it will get to that. The other thing actually that's worth mentioning is actually the, the rise of protective workflows. Um, by the 19th century, you have cotton overalls and, and this kind of thing, which actually reduces the, the more disgusting elements of traveling with someone who might actually be physically soiled from their work. You also see a sort of decline in the way workman passengers are perceived. So bearing in mind that these guys are, are considered fairly dangerous, here's a, a again, it's, it's a cartoon from Punch. Two workman passengers have got into what looks like a district railway first class carriage. Um, it's probably the district railway because you can see how, how open it is. And they're there hobnobbing with respectable ladies and gentlemen. No one seems particularly alarmed. You know, this isn't like the illustrated London police news where someone would be being gratuitously murdered at this point. It's, it's kind of a piece of fun. It's a one off. You wouldn't expect this to happen, but on a, on a regular basis, at least. And it's just kind of interesting because what then you start seeing is that a lot of the newer forms of travel don't even bother with class distinctions. The buses never particularly bother with it. The trams only try it vaguely. So in 1870, um, the Metropolitan Street tramways came up with a concept that if you were a workman passenger, you had to travel on the open top deck. And the Board of Trade heard about it and said, no, you can't do that because that's ridiculous. Um, and from that point on, it, it, they didn't have separate classes of accommodation. You still have the issue of fares because they offer the trams offer workmen's fares early in the morning, but broadly the accommodation is the same. You then get something like the City and, City and South London Railway, open in 1890. Um, here we have King William Street, which is a disused station now, long gone, um, just around the corner from Bank. And essentially this is the south end of the Northern Line. They don't offer any class distinctions. It's, it's just not on their radar. It's designed as a short form of transport, which is probably part of the, the idea and the rationale, but they don't really feel the need. There's only one company that we would consider an underground company that does feel the need, uh, and that's the Metropolitan Railway. The Metropolitan Railway are a fascinating railway because in many respects, they seem to be slightly insane. This is a railway company that once attempted to build a replica of the Eiffel Tower in Wembley, got about a quarter of the way up, then gave up and blew it up with dynamite. They also are the only railway company operating a tube service, so a deep level tube service, that offers first class. And they're so happy about it that they actually capitalize it all in their advert when they announced this in 1915. And the railway they're talking about is the city and, oh, I forgot what it's called, the Great Northern and City Line, which runs between Moorgate and Finsbury Park. It's now part of Great Northern. And it was particularly underused, and they could essentially add an additional carriage. Now, they announced this in 1915. To be honest, there are bigger things going on in 1915, and it's never particularly successful, but we'll come back to it. The other thing they offer is a Pullman train service. So they have two Pullman cars on the Metropolitan Railway. And the idea is again for executives um, to travel in a bit later, have their breakfast on the train, they get into the city um, and a good time is had by all. Again, it doesn't quite work out, which we'll come back to, but they're the only underground railway and the Metropolitan Railway would hate me describing them as an underground railway that even attempts to do this. The rest just don't bother. And really what we start seeing is the rise of things like the Central London Railway. So the two penny tube, a single class of accommodation, you get on the train, you go to where you're going, you get off the train. We're not interested in first, second, third class. It, it's meaningless. And this increasingly becomes the model in London 
for reasons which we'll come back to, but largely around capacity. And what I think is really striking is this image, which is from 1903, isn't particularly different from the kind of image you'd expect today. If you turned up at Bank and you were waiting for a central line train, it would basically look like that. The train would be more modern, the platform obviously wouldn't be made of wood, um, the people would be dressed more contemporarily, but it's not that different. But to someone from the 1860s, that would have been hugely different. And it gives you an idea of the sort of pace of change. Now, what we're gonna move on to now, once I have a little sip of water, is the idea of gender and how ideas of gender are applied to the railways. Now, gender is treated slightly differently. So women passengers, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, aren't perceived as regular users of public transport. They're using a transport system that's been designed by men, is run by men, and broadly is intended to, to serve men. And what happens is they get stereotyped very, very quickly. Um, we have one of these cartoons here, um, and it's a play on this idea that women don't use public transport regularly, so they don't really understand it. So you have this lady asking for a, a, a ticket, the clerk's asking a single ticket as opposed to a return, and she goes, no, 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 for a married woman. And what we get are these two common tropes. There's the trope of the sort of middle-aged and elderly woman who doesn't understand and it's not just a trope that's used in Britain. You see examples of it in Germany uh, and various other countries. And the other trope is the sort of innocent woman who's at risk. And what this is, is just a reflection of the kind of societal ideas that are going on at the time. Um, particularly the idea that the railways fundamentally are for men and public transport is for men. And actually it's not, it's just a stereotype that gets pushed around. And it's a very long lasting stereotype. So. On the left there is a, a cartoon from 1918, How Not to Travel by Tube. It's basically exactly the same idea as the cartoon we just saw in Fun from 1866. On the bottom right, there's a quote from What You Ought to Do If a Lady on the Underground, again from Moonshine in 1891. It's exactly the same as the cartoon. It's this idea that because you're a woman, you don't understand how it works. And the most the most amazingly terrible, I think, examples come from the Railway Traveller's Handybook, which many people will no doubt be familiar with. Um, it's one of the most bizarre books I think I've ever read. Um, the first time I read it, I had to check that it wasn't a spoof that, that someone had made up. But the Traveller's Handybook is entirely designed for a mail commuter. It assumes that anyone taking a season ticket would be a man. It says that if you're female, um, you wouldn't be able to read a Bradshaw's guide, which is the standard guide to train times, um, because it would be, and I quote, a literary puzzle. And it also contains a section entitled, and I kid you not, Disposal of Ladies and Children, which sounds like a beginner's guide for a serial killer now. And essentially it's all around a, a kind of male, Pater Familias putting his family on a train and, and how he should go about doing that, making sure they travel in nice family surroundings. And what you get is, is a system that then is, is not particularly um, adept at serving the female passenger and, and doesn't really understand the female passenger because so much of the discourse is driven by, by men. And one of the things that we get is this idea of the ladies only compartment. So on the left is a I think quite a chilling cartoon actually from 1905. And this was produced after the Merston Tunnel murder. And the Merston Tunnel murder remains unsolved to this day. Um, a young female bookkeeper called Mary Money was traveling in a, in a first class compartment and she was thrown out of the train in the tunnel and her body was found on the track. Now, there's a lot of panics that goes on in the Victorian period about people being murdered in railway compartments. We have the first murder, uh, Thomas Briggs in the 1860s on the North London Railway. He's again thrown out of a railway carriage. And in the sort of, and what we get from that is the regulation of the Railways Act in 1868. And this gives us stuff like the communication cord. Before that, the, the Railway Traveller's Handybook, for example, says that you should tie some sort of rag to a stick, stick it out the carriage window and wave it round in the hope that the guard will be looking up the train and see it. It implements the communication cord, you pull the cord, the guard gets a, a bell ringing, he applies the brakes. 
the chords were uh, of mixed utility. Um, there's a, an example in 1899 where uh, a group of passengers actually find that the toilet adjoining their compartment has caught fire. They pull the communication cord and it falls off. They pull the communication cord on the other side, it also falls off. It's half an hour to the next station and they spend that half an hour dipping into the toilet system to try and put out the flames, which they just about managed to do. Everyone hops out of the next station and the whole thing goes up in smoke. Um, what's interesting is the idea that they take these ideas around safety, which apply to men and women, but there's this very big push around ladies only accommodation. Ladies only accommodation is, is a safe space for women, but it's an idea that broadly comes from men. And it's interesting, we have this quote from the Western Mail in 1875, and it's a good example of what we would call victim blaming now. Essentially, the idea is that women should travel in these compartments, that way they're protected from you know, all the vulgarity that they might experience on the railway network, but it's up to them to do that. If they don't do that, what, what do they expect? What's interesting is they're really unpopular. In the late 19th century, ladies only compartments are fantastically unpopular. In 1875, the Metropolitan Railway introduces ladies only accommodation. And what's interesting is they only introduce it on first and second class compartments. They don't introduce it for third class, again, because the third class is seen as working class and a bit more rough and ready, um, but no one uses them. This is a, a quote from Funny Folks. It kind of outlines what happened and just gives a bit of a description. Um, but essentially, the Metropolitan then give up. It lasts a year and then they don't bother anymore. In 1888, the Board of Trade actually goes round the railway companies and asks them, what ladies only accommodation are you offering? How well is it used? And overwhelmingly, the response is, we offer it, but it's not particularly well used at all. So on the London and South Western Railway, over the period of a week, only 143 seats in ladies only compartments were used out of over a thousand provided. It's very similar on the Great Western Railway. And what's interesting is the Great Western Railway note that while they were conducting these counts, they found that over 5,000 women were traveling in smoking compartments. And we'll come back to that because there's a reason why they flagged that. The Great Eastern Railway said they only had six trains with specific ladies only accommodation all of them long distance and claimed, and I quote, ladies for some reason are unwilling to travel in compartments set aside wholly for them. What's interesting is if the Great Eastern had actually deigned to ask any of its women travelers, it would have got an answer fairly quickly because women write into the papers to explain why they don't want to use the accommodation. One of the big things is around a sort of competing notion of femininity. So for a lot of the railway companies, these compartments are seen as family spaces. And what happens is that particularly railway staff like porters and guards would put families into compartments, basically try and keep the kids away from other, you know, the men on the train. But that isn't necessarily a particularly pleasant experience for anyone else. Um, one woman writes in 1875 saying that she's got into one of these compartments and there was a nurse and a, a child in there. And she was nearly burned to death because the nurse pulled out a spirit lamp and tried heating up some milk for the baby and nearly set the whole compartment on fire. And she said, I think that's one reason why I for one don't use them. And I'm sure a lot of people, others, a lot of other women don't. There's also another wonderful quote from a, a lady who wrote into a paper who said that, and again, I quote, women are as a rule very fond of their own children, but I for one draw the line at other people's children when they behave like little monsters. So you see this competing kind of aspect of, of what they're actually for. And the other issue, which again is touched on, is actually ironically safety. So they're implemented as, as a kind of a safety feature, but what happens is because they're so underused, often women are traveling in them alone. And because they're ladies only and they're marked out, they become targets. And women write into the paper saying that you know, men do get into these compartments and there's no way of, of stopping them from doing that. You're reliant on the guard of the train stopping that and policing that. And sometimes they don't. So actually it's safer to travel in a compartment where there are four or five other people, even if that is a smoking compartment. Now, the smoking compartments are, again, rather interesting. So ladies only compartments were effectively defined by regulation as a female space. It's for ladies only. Smoking compartments aren't 
gendered in terms of rules or regulations around who can use them or not. But they very quickly become assumed by men to be men only. And some people actually write into the, the newspapers saying these are men only compartments, what, what, what's going on? And a lot of men get very unhappy about the fact that women are coming into these compartments and traveling with them. So again, there's, there's a quote from Funny Folks on the left there from 1883. Um, and then there's a, a, an image from Fun from 1895. And there becomes this big, again, sort of strange moral panic about young women getting into smoking compartments and maybe, dare I say, even being smokers. Um, and it's described by some people in the newspapers as the invasion. Um, it's considered that big a deal. There's a, a fantastic quote from a, a gentleman who wrote into the Times in 1871, which I'll, I'll read out to you. And he said, can, any, can you or anyone satisfactorily explain why ladies, and especially young ones, force themselves knowingly into smoking compartments? I was traveling north lately from rugby and found to my disgust that the only smoking compartment was occupied by a young lady. In the next compartment of the same carriage were only two passengers, a lady and gentleman. I requested that the guard point out to the young lady that she was in a smoking compartment and requested that she move because there was plenty of room next door. He did so. She refused. It's this kind of idea that, of course, she should have moved. She, she was in a smoking compartment. She shouldn't be in here. Um, and it's another example of how this kind of wider societal idea is introduced onto the railway system. No railway executive goes around saying smokers compartments are for men only. It's the passengers that do that and the passengers that try and force that issue. There's another couple of um, quotes here. This is from, a, again, a letter to the Morning Post. It's by a man who signed himself Justice, and he's possibly the most indignant man uh, ever to write a letter to the Morning Post. Uh, if there was an indignant man award for 1881, I think Justice probably would have won it. Um, and again, it, it replicates this idea, smoking compartments are for men, because the kinds of women that would travel in a smoking compartment are, are vulgar. In 1881, there's an American etiquette guide. And again, I'll, I'll quote a couple of lines from it because it's, it's quite insightful. And it says that in England, no gentleman will ever insult a lady by smoking in the streets in her company. And it added, it is neither respectful nor polite to smoke in the presence of ladies, even though they have given their permission, nor should a gentleman smoke in a room in which ladies are in the habit of frequenting. Now, these ideas get regurgitated by male passengers. Um, a lot of smokers write into the newspapers to complain that a lady's got into their compartment and they've had to put out their cigarette or thrown away their cigar or put out their pipe. Um, one gentleman writes in to say that a young woman and a baby got into the compartment. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll quote him. He says, for myself who cared but little whether I smoked or not, but very much whether I had insisted in licensed infanticide, I resigned my smoke and retired to another carriage. What was interesting is uh, a woman actually wrote into the papers to complain about this and the fact that men were complaining about it. She said that she had inadvertently got into a, a smoking compartment containing a man uh, and he saw her and when he did so, he threw the end of his cigar out the window and he glared at her. Uh, and in her letter, she said, I'm pretty sure he spent the rest of that journey composing a very outraged letter to the nearest newspaper. And again, who knows, maybe it was the gentleman that wrote into the Morning Post in 1881. So over time, that kind of idea breaks down. And it's, again, something we'll, we'll sort of come back to as we, we come to the end of this. Um, but what really is one of the biggest drivers of the collapse of all this kind of segregation and division is capacity. Segregating people is very easy when you have space. If you have lots of space, you can keep people as far apart from each other as, as they'll go. What happens in London in particular and on the railways is that so many people are traveling that it gets really difficult dividing them all up, particularly when you have a system where a train can potentially have first, second and third class accommodation, smoking and non-smoking, and then also ladies only compartments. That's a lot of different types of accommodation to provide on a single train. And what happens is people just can't fit anymore. So there's this wonderful image of, again, from H.M. Bateman, 1923, environment, which shows um, customers on a, on a train, a tube train during the rush hour. 
Uh, the quote at the top is from the 1919 Select Committee. Oh, unfortunately, it's chopped the rest of it off. Um, but it's the 1990 Select Committee that looks into um, work in London and, and public transport. And it's one of those when it's one of those um, items that really flags the, the idea of the rush hour. Uh, initially, it's called the crush hour. But you get this idea that things are so overcrowded that it's kind of madness down there. What is interesting is the railway companies begin to realise this. So in 1896, the, the London and South Western actually lowers the, the cost of its second class fare. And it does so again to try and play up this kind of snobbishness. Um, but what happens is they get so many second class passengers travelling, they don't fit. And one of these second class passengers writes in to complain that there's no point in me buying a ticket anymore because I have to travel third class anyway, because I can't physically get in the train. In 1899, on the Great Northern, there's so much overcrowding in first class that someone complains that there are actually disturbances going on as 18 first class passengers try and fit in a compartment designed for 10. And what's interesting is when this starts happening, particularly when you get congestion, particularly when lower class customers start traveling in a higher class, the railway companies can't prosecute them. So if you're third class and you travel in a first class compartment, in normal circumstances, they will take you to court, which they do very regularly, and they will fine you and prosecute you. If the train is overcrowded, that doesn't apply. It's a bit like today having a declassification of first class. And you can see that in the quote on the bottom right. This is from a court case in 1920. Um, a third class passenger was taken to court for traveling in a first class compartment. And the magistrate goes, why? Why are you here? This just isn't a thing anymore because we don't have the capacity to offer it. It's something that's building up before the First World War, which is why I mentioned the London and South Western and Great Northern examples. But it's, it's the war that really makes it very, very real. And it's interesting because at this point, the railway companies just can't win. So this is a letter to the Times in 1914. The letter responds to the district railway putting out adverts in the newspapers saying that they were going to basically prosecute anyone who traveled in a first class compartment um, without the appropriate first class ticket. And the reaction is, is quite aggressive um, from third class passengers. And what's interesting is these passengers are now writing into the Times. You know, these aren't your excursion traffic of the 1870s. These are respectable people who are saying, well, in third class, it's an absolute scandal. What, what are you playing at? And what's interesting is the district line basically gets to the point where they're kind of agreeing. Um, they want to get rid of it. Uh, and in fact, they actually talk about getting rid of first class pretty quickly. In terms of second class, that's the one that first goes. Because third class accommodation is so much better, because you have these changing perceptions of what third class actually delivers, a lot of the railway companies start jettisoning it. Now, the Midland is the first in 1875, but in London, we're talking in the 1890s. So the London Tilbury and South End get rid of it in 1893, the Great Western 1910, London Northwestern 1912. The Metropolitan and the Metropolitan District, as they implement their electric train services, they get rid of it in 1905 and 1906, the London and Brighton in 1912. The only area that it lingers on well into the interwar period is actually on the London and Northeastern Railway, and that's specifically on the old lines of the Great Eastern Railway and the Great Northern Railway, which is where they develop that incredibly intense workman's half fare ordinary train system before the war. And essentially, it's, it's a hangover that they can't quite get rid of um, until they start with their sort of general modernization programs. This is one of the things that they're trying to avoid. So again, it's, it's a nice little cartoon from the Mirror, 1910, unclassified man in the days of classified trains. And if you can't quite read what the compartments are divvied up in, we have babies only, the silence compartment, dogs, ladies only, golfers only, and engaged couples only. And the poor chap here just can't find a relevant space for himself on the train. Um, and what the railway companies are doing is they're, they're taking note of this. So on the district railway, as I said, in 1918, they seriously talk about abolishing first class because they can't even offer it anymore on the east end of the line. The line is so crowded, they can't get the passengers into the train. So they, they, they've stopped bothering. In the event, they keep it, but only because the Metropolitan Railway, which is particularly obsessed around first class passengers, still offers it. And it becomes a bit of an inconvenience to have the two different classes of, of or types of accommodation being offered. So they, they just go with the Met. But what happens is 1933, the London Passenger Transport Board is created. 
the underground effectively takes over the Metropolitan Railway and very quickly these kind of first class um, accommodations disappear. So the Great Northern and City, the, the only tube to have first class, loses it a year after in 1934. On the Hammersmith and City and East London line, 1936. The Pullman cars go in 1939 and through the interwar period, they're so underused that apparently well-dressed third class passengers could even travel if they were willing to pay a little bit more. Um, and in 1941, first class is actually just abolished across the whole London Passenger Transport Board area because of congestion created by the Second World War. It's the sort of final flash in the pan for it. Uh, and broadly speaking, that's still true today. If you're using a train service that's wholly within Greater London, it, it doesn't normally offer first class. It's only on trains that travel beyond that Greater London boundary that do, because that was um, what they implemented in, in the 1940s. What we also see is this big shift in the number and the type of women traveling. The female commuter becomes a much bigger deal. Um, these are a couple of quotes from 1919 and 1918. Um, the war obviously creates a huge amount of change. There's a lot of female employment as women take over male positions. But what we see is even after the war, um, female clerical workers in particular remain a really big part of, of the traffic. Um, What's interesting, though, is the stereotypes still remain. Um, there's this quote down there at the bottom from the superintendent of the line who worked for the underground. Um, and basically, he's complaining that the reason why we're having issues, people boarding and, and alighting from the trains, is because of women and soldiers, because they don't know how to use the system. It's definitely rubbish. The problem the underground have is the system is so overwhelmed by the sheer volume of passengers they're carrying. That's why people just physically can't get in and out of the trains. But it's interesting that a senior male manager still perceives that women are somehow an encumbrance to the operation of their railway. By the interwar period, we know that around a third of commuters in London are women. And we also see a real big change in things like working hours. Um, but this is a really nice image which gives it a, a bit more life. So on the top left we have a workman's train at Liverpool Street Station in 1884. You can see we have a, a load of rough and ready gents. Uh, the clothes look a little bit tatty. They look like a, a great bunch of lads to have a drink with but you probably wouldn't want to travel with them on a regular basis. On the bottom right we have customers queuing for workman's tickets at Morden in 1938 and you can see everyone is a lot more respectably dressed. Around a third of the commuters are female. It's a very different picture. And although workman's tickets still are largely used by people of poorer means and people who tend to be what, what one would describe as more manual or working class workers, you can see that those divisions are really beginning to fade. And they're certainly nowhere near what they had been um, a few decades before. And again, it's just to re-emphasize that a lot of this is because of just how crowded things are. Um, there's just not the space to separate people out. And it's also just becoming more acceptable for the vast majority of customers just to travel together. And I think particularly traveling within London at this point, if you're the kind of individual who is traveling um, into London, you're extremely upper class and you're extremely concerned around your space, you drive you don't even use a train because you don't have to. You have the means to afford to travel in a different way. What's also important just to quickly note is that the whole time division starts to break down as well. So what happens during the war is working, working class manual workers get a big boost in pay. And because of changes in working hours and the sort of move to the eight hour day, um, they start traveling later. Clerical workers are seen as being underpaid because they haven't benefited from war bonuses. And the argument is you start getting this, this mix together of the traffic. It just gets increasingly difficult to tell people apart. So there's no point ultimately trying to separate them with a really complicated graduate system of fares. So what I'll end is this, this quote from um, Llewellyn Smith, who was the editor of the, the new survey of London Life and Labour, which is a, a massive social survey in the interwar period, which tried to replicate Charles Booth's earlier social survey. Um, and it's an interesting quote, because basically what Llewellyn Smith implies here is that class has kind of dis disappeared. Class distinctions have gone because public transport has allowed people to travel around and with each other to such an extent that you know, it's kind of tamed everything. It's kind of leveled it all out. I don't think that's that's entirely true. I think actually what we have is something that's a lot more cyclical. 
as we know, the railway companies try and replicate the society they operate within, and then that in turn influences the society that's using it. So it's not quite as simple as that, but it's quite an interesting place to end. And hopefully what we've done is given a bit of an overview of just what we can use public transport for in terms of looking at the bigger divisions within society, particularly in terms of social class and gender. So I'll stop there and I will, I'll stop sharing my screen and I will hand back to David, but thank you so much for listening.